Hello class, in this video, we're going to be covering the um, test three review. So in this review, there are 28 questions. And on the test itself, there are anywhere between 16 and 19 questions. Um, I can't remember. I can look it up real quick. I can't remember the specific number of questions, but give me just a second and I will get that detail. So number three has 18 questions. Each question is worth five points, except for 15 and 18, which are each worth 10 points, most likely because they have um, parts to them, or it's like two questions in one. Um, okay, so for number one, it says, suppose that the local sales tax rate is 6% and you choose a car for $26,400. How much tax is paid? So to determine the tax, you're going to take your purchase amount times 6%. And if you type that in the calculator, 26400 times six second percent, you hit enter and it tells you the tax. So that's the answer to the first part. Then the second part says, what is the car's total cost? So you have to pay for the purchase of the car, and then you also have to pay for the tax on the car. And so this gives you the total cost. Now, number two says an exercise machine with an original price of $730 is on sale at 12% off. A, what is the discount amount? B, what is the exercise machine's sale price? So if we wanna know what 12% off is, we need to take 12% of the 730, the original price. So you take the original price times 12% off. This gives you how much of the discount you're going to get. Since it's a discount, we're going to take the original price and we're gonna subtract this discount. And then that removes that cost from the cost of the machine. So this is now called the sale price. And that is what was entered here. Now, number three says a circle graph shows a breakdown of spending for average household using 365 days worked as a basis of comparison. What percentage of work time does the average household spend paying for recreation? So they have all the amount, they basically broke it up um, into, you know, if I'm gonna have to pay X amount of dollars, how many, how many hours a week do I need to work to pay that amount? Um, and then how much does that add up to throughout the year, right? Um, so it turns out that for recreation, you have to work for three weeks, right? 21 days um, to pay for all your recreation throughout the year. Now, what I've done here to find the percent is you always wanna take the part over the whole, and then you convert it to a percent. So the part of all my hours, right, or this family's hours is 21 days for recreation. What is the whole number of days that we're talking about in this pie? Well, that it told us right here, 365 days. Um, you most likely could have added all these days together, but they already told it to us. So they're making our lives a little bit easier. Then in the calculator, I just typed in 21, 21 over 365, and it pops back out a fraction. So I hit this double arrow right here on the calculator, and it gives me this decimal, which is the decimal that I have there. Now to change it to percent, I know, or I remember to move it two times to the right, but if you don't remember and you do have your calculator handy, you can click on this, which has a little arrow, which means it's gonna to convert to percent. So we're gonna hit second, and then that arrow, percent, and then hit enter, and it converts it to percent. Now, I believe that it does say down here that it's around to one decimal place as needed. So even though this is the percentage that I got in the calculator, I did have to round it to one decimal place. So the five does make the seven go up, 
and so it becomes 5.8 percent. Number four says the bar graph shows that life expectancy, number of years newborns are expected to live in a particular region has increased dramatically since the ancient times. Of the new region from the Stone Age to 2016. So here we have a chart and it wants us to find that percent increase. Percent increase is always going to be a difference over the original. Okay, that's how you do percent increase or percent decrease. Um, it's just you have to make sure you put the larger number first and then the smaller number after the minus sign. So if we're talking about from the Stone Age in 2016, then we're talking about these two amounts, okay? So we're going to subtract those two amounts, take the bigger number minus the smaller number, and we have to place it over the original. Now, as far as time is concerned, this time period happens before this time period. So it would actually be his number that we have to put at the bottom, okay? This one is considered the original. This one's considered the original, and then this one's considered the new one. Now, when I do that difference, I do that in my calculator, clear fraction, 69 minus 24 over 24, I get double arrow. I get that as my decimal, then I did convert to percent, and I got this as my percentage, and it did say to round to the nearest integer. So that's this spot, and the five does change that seven to an eight, so it became 188. Now number five says a sofa regularly sells for 820. The sale price is 7.29 and 80 cents. Find the discount rate. Well, first we have to figure out how much was discounted, okay? So if the original was this and the sale price is this, this is how much was marked off, okay? Then in order for me to find the percent, remember you're always gonna do the part over the whole. Um, in this case, it's gonna be the discount over the original price, okay? It's the same thing, but in a different way, okay? So my discount is 90.2, and my original was 820. Now, if I type that in the calculator, and I think on this one, I did skip some steps. So that one, I just got 11. Oh, I did get the decimal, and then I just moved over. over. But if you convert in the calculator, it tells you the same thing, 11%. So it was 11% off. Now. We can move to number six. So number six here says, um, if $909 is borrowed at 3% simple interest for two years, find the simple interest earned and the total amount to be paid back. So they give me the principal or the amount I borrowed, 990, my rate, 3%, and T is in two years. As long as this is in years, I do not have to convert my time, okay? So my interest is going to be the principal times the rate times the time. So 930 times 3% times two. And if you enter it in your calculator just like that, it does pop out um, 59.4. Now, it didn't have another digit after four, but since I'm talking about money, I placed in a zero to fill in that second digit for money. Um, it does say to round to the nearest cent, so I do have to have that zero in there. Now, for the total amount to be paid back, well, you have to pay back what you borrowed plus your interest. So your total amount that you have to pay back is gonna be your principal plus your interest. Now, um, that's going to give me this uh, 1,049.47. And you didn't need to round that because it was already in cents. Now for number seven, it says, 
if $14,500 is borrowed at 5% simple interest for 150 days, find the simple interest owned and the amount total amount owed, assume that one year equals 360 days. So same formula. The problem is, is that T in this case is in 150 days. But it's supposed to be in years. Okay. And so in order for you to convert this to years, we have to know how many years or what is the ratio of years to days. Okay. And we want days at the bottom so they can cancel these units and we end up with years. Now, I do know the ratio though, one year is 360 days. So what happens when you do 150 times one, you get 150, and the only number at the bottom is 360. So you end up with this fraction as representing the number of years, okay? So when I plugged in for time, I put in my principal the way it was, I put in my 5% the way it was, but for my time, I had to have it in units of years. I could not type in 15 days here. So I had to type, or 150 days. I had to type in this fraction, 150 over 360 to represent that unit in years. Then I multiplied all of that and I literally just type it all in my calculator. And you will notice eventually that a lot of this class is typing in the calculator. If you haven't noticed already. I think it was only the first unit where we didn't use a calculator like a bunch of bunch. So that's a fraction. I'm going to hit the double arrow and I get this decimal. And then um, it said I think to round it to the nearest cent. So the three did not make the eight go up. So it just stayed 302.08. Um, and then for part B, it says the total amount owed. Remember, the total amount that you owe is going to be your principal plus your interest. So my principal was P, what I started with, what I'm going to borrow. And then my interest was this 30208. And so the total amount comes out to $14,802.08. Now number six says, if 1,615 and 73 cents was paid back on a simple interest loan of $1,600 for 30 days, what was the simple interest rate? Assume one year equals 360 days. So um, the same thing is gonna happen again. So I know how much was paid back. So I know the total amount. So I had to use this formula instead of this formula. Um, the total amount that I paid back was the 1615.73. The amount that they borrowed was 1600. This is the number one. My rate is what they're asking me to figure out. So it's just an R. And then T is um, this amount. Now, I don't want to do it this way, actually. So I'm actually going to do this problem the other way because I showed you guys a different way to do this problem. This is not the way I prefer to do it. It's a little bit more difficult than the other way. And I'd rather make things easier, right, instead of making things harder. So my brain actually does that because I'm algebraic and I can solve anything, but it is a little more complicated. Um, and it's the same thing for this. We already know the answers, but we'll find them in a different way. Well, I think that one I had to leave. I don't think I could have changed that one. Oops. Okay. So for this one, what we're going to do is we're going to take 16, 15. 0.73. Now remember, just like A equals PI, I can also minus P on both sides, and then I get the equation that I by itself will equal A minus P. And so that's what we're doing here is we're going to do A, take away the principal, and we're going to end up with just the amount of interest. Okay, once you know the amount of interest, then you can plug them into this formula. 
I equals PRT. So you could do this one with the other formula. So I is 15.73. P is um, 1600. R we don't know. And T we know is 330 days. But remember, you have to do 30 days out of 360 to get that in years. It has to be in years. Okay. So I'm going to multiply these two numbers together. So 160 times 30 over 360. Oops, wrong spot. And I get that. I'm going to type it in as a, a decimal. So I get 13.33 repeating times R. Now, if I'm trying to solve for R, I'm going to have to divide by what's multiplied by it. So I'm going to divide both sides by this 13.3 repeating. So that will cancel that. And I will have um, R by itself on this side. And over there, I will have 15.73 divided by that thing. I get this number. So 1.179. Seven five, and it does have to be in a percentage, so I can go second percent, and you get um one one seven. I must have typed in the wrong number here somewhere. No sixteen hundred. What did I type in the calculator? Oh, I was supposed to type in sixteen hundred, and I typed in one hundred and sixty. So backtrack. Insert another zero. So when I multiply these two, I actually get 133.333. So then I have to divide both sides by 133.333. So 15.73 divided by that number. There we go. So then I get the decimal. 0 0.117975, convert that to a percentage, and I get 11.7975%, but it does say round to the nearest tenth of a percent, which is this spot. So that nine will make that go up to 11.8%, and that was the response that we had in there. But it was a lot less algebra, all I had to do was uh, divide. We just had to multiply and then divide. Now for number nine, it says determine the present value that must be invested at 6%, 6.1% simple interest so that 5.1 years, there will be this amount in the account. Now this one's different. Um, I don't know anything about the amount. Um, And I mean, I could calculate the interest. Hmm. We'll just use the formula they gave us. So A equals P one plus um, RT like that. And let's plug in, well, we can't plug in A with, oh yeah, we can. We want this amount afterward. I'm actually gonna go, no, I'll stay here. 8500. Zero, zero. My principal is the amount that I don't know. I need to figure that out. That's what I need to know. I need to know my investment. 1 plus R, which is 6.1%, times T, which is 5.1 years. So I don't need to convert that one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type everything in the parentheses in the calculator. And I get 8500 zero, zero equals P times 1.306. Since I'm solving for P, I'm going to divide both sides by 1.306. And that will tell me 8500 divided by that number. I get 658. 
0.4226, blah, blah, blah. And it does say round up to the nearest cent. So it doesn't matter what this is. If there's anything after the cents, it's going to make it go up. So this should be 658.43 for my principal. Why do I get something different? I must have done something wrong. This is 8,500, yep. That's one plus 6.1% of that. Hmm. Oh, I did do something. Look at my calculator. I put 6% instead of 6.1%. That will change things. Look, it changes a tiny, tiny bit. This little number right here would be a five and not a six. Let's see how much that's going to change it. This is kind of the reason why I always ask students to turn in paperwork. But in the past, when I required people to turn in paperwork, I got a lot of kickback um, and a lot of complaints about why was I requiring paperwork and why do they get zeros just because they don't turn in their paperwork. Um, so I stopped making it a requirement and I just made it optional. So People don't want to turn it in and they, you know, whatever happens, happens, I guess. But the ones that do turn it in, I feel like I'm still not getting the same answer. No, I'm still not getting the same answer. Let me look at it. Okay, I figured out where I was going wrong. I just wasn't typing in these decimal points. First, I didn't type in the 6.1. Then I didn't type in the 5.1. So I finally typed in 1 plus 6.1% times 5.1, and I got this decimal. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm having an issue typing that all those decimals in my calculator, but that is exactly the reason I was saying that you want to type, you want to turn in your paperwork. Because if I notice that you have the right formula down, but then all of a sudden you have the wrong number there, I know it's just a matter of you typing something wrong in the calculator. And then you have all the rest of the steps correct, but your number's off a little bit because you didn't type in something in the calculator correctly. That is worth way more points than just not knowing what to do at all or just guessing or, um, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, that's why I really, really, really recommend that people turn in their paperwork. But like I said, I got a lot of pushback from it in the past. And so I haven't required it since then. Um, I've just made it optional. But it is for your benefit, not for anyone else's. So if I round to the nearest cent, that's going to make the zero go up to one. So 6483.11. And now it matches this answer here. I apologize for wasting so much time on this problem. Okay. Number 10, it says, in order to start a small business, a student takes out a simple loan, a simple interest loan for $3,000 for three months at a rate of 7%. How much interest must the student pay and find the future value of the loan? So if I wanna know the interest that I must pay, I must do the amount that I'm borrowing times 7% times the time, but this is in three months. So we have to take those three months and we have to multiply it by the number, the ratio of years and months. And you want months at the bottom so they can cancel and you can end up with years, okay? Well, I know that one year has 12 months. So when you multiply top times top, you get three and then the bottom number is um, 12. And so that's where we're getting that three over 12. Now, when I multiply all three of these in your calculator, just like that, we end up with this result. Then if I want to know the future value, I have to take my principal plus my interest I just found. So the principal was 3000 my interest was 5250 and that gives me this total for my future value. Now, number 11 says uh, 2500 is invested in 5.7% compounded quarterly. 
how much is in the account after three years and what is the total interest earned? Now, anytime it says, if it says simple interest, then you're using this formula to calculate future value. But if you're, you have like compounded quarterly, compounded, any kind of compounding at all, you have to be using one of the compound interest formulas. Okay. Now this one is for compounded continuously. This one is for compounded a certain number of times per year. And I have this broke down on my paper, but for you, you need to make sure that you have that breakdown on your note sheet. Okay, that's not, all that's in writing. So it's not something that's gonna be on the note sheet that you're given in the test itself, okay? So what you get on the test itself is this sheet of paper without all my writing on it. So definitely write this information, you know, write that that one's for continuous. These are for compounded some number of times per year. So if it says compounded annually, compounded semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, compounded weekly, compounded daily, these are the N values that you use. Now for this one, it said quarterly. So N is equal to four and I'm using that formula. So A equals P one plus R over T and then or no, R over N and then N times T. And T is in years, so we can just plug in the three like the way it is. I literally type all of that in my calculator, just like it looks on the paper. One plus fraction 5.7% over four, close, raise it to the four times three. And it literally pops out an answer. It pops out, what, six, four, nine, zero, two, five. And if you round that to the nearest cent, it's 2962.6, that goes up to five. And so that's what they have there for the amount of money after three years. Then it said the amount of interest earned. So remember your interest equals A minus P. So that was the A that we just found minus the original um, amount I invested. And that's the result. So that's just my interest. Panel number 12 says 3,000 is invested at 2.75% compounded daily. Daily means the N is 360. How much is in the account after 4.5 years and what is the total interest earned? So we're using that same formula, the P, which is the amount that you invest or you borrow. So P is right here, $3,000 invested. One plus my rate, which is always your percentage. The number of times is compounded is 360 and then to the power in T, 360 times 4.5. It is in years, so we're good, which is 4.5. You type all of that in a calculator and round it to the nearest hundred through the nearest cent and you get this amount. Then in order for you to find the interest, you have to take that amount that you just found minus the original principle. So A minus P equals your interest. Now, number 13 says, how much money should be deposited today in an account that earns 3% compounded annually so that it will accumulate to 12,000 in three years? So this time they're asking me what should be deposited. So they're basically asking me what should P be? So in that case, I'm gonna use this bottom formula that tells me how to find P. So in that formula, it says, um, I wrote it like this. I don't even know why I wrote it like that because that's not how it's written on the paper. On the paper, it's written as um, A, which is the 12,000 parentheses one plus R over N, which was two because it said semi-annually, raised to the power negative N times T, which is three years. And so if you type all of that in your calculator, um, one plus fraction 3% over two raised to the two, oh, to the negative two times three. And you do get, where did the number in Y? I did type in 12,000. 
12,001 plus, make sure my percentage is correct, three in semi-annually. Oh, I'm kind of worrying because I typed in the wrong button up there. I hit a negative instead of the times. I hit minus instead of times. There we go. And so now I get this number, but I rounded it to the nearest cent. So it became 51 cents. And then that's the answer there. Um, and the formula that, oh, that's why I used that other formula. The reason why I use that other formula is because it asked me which formula would you use or here's some formulas that you might wanna use. And this one was in there. And so that's the one that I was using. But just FYI, if you have a negative exponent, what it does is it puts all of this in the denominator and it changes it to a positive exponent. Well, that's exactly what's represented here is all of that at the bottom of the fraction bar with the positive exponent. So regardless of which formula you used, if you use the one on the note sheet or you use the one on um, this um, in the program, they both gave us the same answer. My lab math, okay. They both are the same thing, they're equivalent. Okay, so since I had that formula up there, that's the one that I used on the next problem because the next problem said the exact same thing. How much money should be deposited in an account that earns 8% compounded monthly so that it will accumulate to 10,000 in three years? So 10,000 is what I want, so that's my A. One plus R was 8% compounded monthly, which means N is 12, so my exponent is 12 times three because it's three years. Um, and I typed all of them in calculator, rounded to the nearest cent, and we ended up with that value. <clears throat> now, let's go on to 18, or 15, I'm sorry. So 15 says a passbook savings account has a rate of 12%. Find the effective annual yield, round it to the nearest tenth of a percent if the interest is compounded semi-annually. Now, semi-annually means that N equals two. Um, I, if you click on the formulas, you can view. And of these three formulas, this is the formula that's gonna give you the yield, okay? And this one is exactly the same as it is on the note sheet. So for my yield, I need to know one plus my rate, which is 12% over N, which is two, parentheses, power of two minus one. I typed all of that in the calculator and I got this decimal. I converted that decimal to percent and I got this value, but then it said round to the nearest tenth. So this six made the three go up to a four. And so the final answer is 12.4%. Now for number 16, it says a person deposits um, $2,700 in an account that pays 7% interest compounded once a year. So compounded once a year means N equals one. Person B deposits two hundred or $2,250 in an account that pays 8% compounded monthly, which in this case means N equals 12. Um, Now it says complete parts A through C below. So for part A, it says, who will have more money in their account after one year? Okay, so that means T equals one. And how much more? Select the correct choice below and fill in the answer box. So for the first one, it would be 2,700, one plus R over T, which is one, into the power, or R over N, which is one, and then to the power N times T, so one times one. I typed all of that in the calculator and it gave me this value. Then I entered this one and it would be um, now 2250, uh, one plus this guy's rate, which is 8%, compounded monthly, raised to the power 12 times T, which is one. So I typed all of that in the calculator and it gave me this value. 
then in order for me to figure out, well, obviously this one is the one that has more, right? So it's person A will have more than person B. So I had selected this. But then I needed to find out by how much more. So I took person A minus, or option A minus option B, and I got this value. Um, and it did say round to the nearest dollar. So uh, this is not gonna change that. So it stayed 452. Now for part B, it says, who will have more money in their account after five years? So same formula. The only thing that's gonna change is the time. So that number changes from a one to a five. Um, and then you enter the whole thing in a calculator, you get this value, enter this one, you get this value. So then when I subtracted the two, well, actually which one had more? Um, person A still has more. And when you find the difference, you end up with 435. Now part C says who will have um, more money in their account after 20 years? So again, everything stays the same. The only thing changing is the time, the T. So plugged all of this in, we got this value, plugged all of this in, we got this value. And I believe that we were rounding to the um, nearest dollar from the beginning. Instead of doing it at the end, I just did both of these rounded to the nearest dollar and then everything else was already rounded. Um, so I rounded these two to the nearest dollar and then when you find the difference, you're already good to go. Um, and it did ask me which formula down here we could have used since we are finding how much is in the account afterward. This is the formula that I've been using. I just used it from my note sheet rather than from the assignment. Um, so let's see, number 17. We have 2000 is deposited at the end of each year into an annual annuity, annuity paying 5% compounded annually, which means N equals one, how much money will be in the account after 20 years? So this means T equals two. This is what is deposited, which means that is P. Um, and then your R is always the percentages. It says, what is the total interest earned? Okay. So it wants to know the annuity and the interest earned. So I went over to my formula page for the annuities and I have this formula here. So this is the formula that I'm using. So if that's what's being deposited, that's my PM. And then one plus R over N to the power N T minus one over R over N. And this was in parentheses. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I typed in all of that in my calculator and I did round it to the nearest dollar and I got this value. Then it says, find the interest that was earned. So remember, that's how much I'm gonna have in the account, but I'm paying $20,000 per year for 20 years. So these are gonna cancel and it's actually this much money that I'm deposited. So if that's all the money that I put in, and this is the amount of money that's there after 20 years, then you just need to subtract the two values to figure out how much interest was earned. Because all the rest of the money was money that was made, not money that you put in. Okay, now number 18 says $3,000 is deposited at the end of each quarterly. It should be at the end of each quarter. Um, which means that N equals four into an account paying this, which is R. Oh, yeah, at each quarter. That's not the N. When it says compounded, whatever, that's the N. Okay, so compounded quarterly means that I'm going to have N equal to four. It says how much will be in the account after four years, which is T. <clears throat> what is the total interest term? So again, I'm using that same formula on the annuities page. So my, my um, deposits here, it doesn't matter how consistently they are. You just put the amount of deposits there. Then you do one plus your rate over how many times is compounded, raised to the N times T minus one over R over N. I type all of that in my calculator. And if you don't know how to type that in the calculator, it is pretty simple. 
So you do fraction bar, 3,000 parentheses for the bracket, parentheses for the parentheses, one plus fraction, 5.25% over four, go to the side, close that parentheses, raise it to the four times four, come down, minus one, and close that parentheses. At the bottom, you're going to do parentheses, fraction, 5.25%, oops, I pressed the wrong button, percent over four, go to the side, and close parentheses. It's all in there, and I get this value, but rounded to the nearest dollar is just 53027, because the one is not enough to make it go up. Now I need to find out how much money I'm depositing. Well, I'm depositing this quarterly, which means I'm going to deposit that four times per year for four years, which means this is my total deposits. And then if I want to know how much interest I'm, I've earned, I'm going to do A minus my um, deposits. And that equals the interest. Okay. It's a minus P, right? And P is your deposit. You just have to put the total deposits there for P, not just the one. Okay, now for number 19, we have how much has to be deposited per year in an account paying 6% interest compounded annually, so N equals one, to have 160,000 in the account after 18 years. This one's P. How much comes from the deposits and how much comes from the interest earned? So they're asking us to find how much has to be deposited. So they're asking us for PM, okay? And under annuities, we do have a formula that tells us how to find that periodic payment, the periodic deposit. So in here, we actually have to do A, which is 160,000 times R over N, then one plus R over N to the N times T minus one. Type all of that in the calculator, you get this. It said round up to the nearest dollar, so it doesn't matter what's behind the decimal, this will go up to uh, seven, eight. The only time it won't go up is if there's no decimal at all, and then there's no need to round. Now, that's the amount of the periodic deposit. But in order for me to figure out what was from deposits and what was from interest, I do need to figure out the total deposits. So it was this much, but only one time per year. So it was 5178 times one time per year times 18 years, which gave me this is my total deposits. So that's gonna be how much came from just the deposits, okay? Then if I wanna know how much came from interest, remember you're doing A minus P. So A is 160,000 minus P, which is the total deposits, gives me the amount of interest. So that tells me how much came from interest. Now, number 20 says, how much has to be deposited per month in an account paying 7.75% interest compounded monthly, N equals two, to have a hundred or to have a million in the account after 40 years. So that's T. It says, how much comes from deposits and how much comes from interest? So it's exactly like number 19. We use the exact same formula, but with these specific values. So 1 million, um, my R over my N, one plus R over N, N to the times T minus one. And this is what it came out to when I rounded up. So let's see what it came out to before we round it up. Clear fraction. One, two, three, one, two, three. Over 12, close, go down to the bottom. One plus fraction, 7.75% over 12. Close, raise to the 12 times 40, get down, minus one. I got this, but it doesn't matter what the decimal is because it says to round up. So we actually end up with this. But when it rounds up, it doesn't matter what that is, it will go to 309. 
oh, sorry, it's 307 point blah, 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 blah. And so it goes up to 308. I think I saw that number, <laughs> so I wrote it down. Um, and then if I want to find how much goes to the interest and how much is from deposits, we have 308. But remember, they said that this much must be deposited per month, which means I'm doing it 12 times per year times the 40 years. So this is my total deposit. And then if I want to figure out the interest, I have to do A minus the total deposits equals the interest. And so then this is my interest. So total deposits was the 14 or 147,840. And this one was 852,160. Now number 21 is reading the stock table. So it says, what are the high and low prices for the past 15 weeks? Remember I told you that this label goes for both of these. So if you do have your 15 week high and your 15 week low right there. It says, if you own 700 shares of this stock last year, what was the dividend? Since they're talking about dividend, this is the multiplier. So you take those 700 shocks, uh, stocks and you, or shares and you uh, multiply it by the dividend and it gives you that value. Um, remember, dividend is a multiplier. So whatever the dividend is, that is what you multiply by. Now, what is the annual return for dividends alone? How does this compare to a bank offering 3%? So um, the dividends, the annual return, that's another word for yield, okay? So when they say yield, you're gonna look for this value which is 3.8%, okay? So what is the yield? The yield is 3.8%. Um, now it says, how does this compare to a bank offering 3%? Well, in that case, isn't 3%, this one says the bank rate is lower than 3%. So bank rate is 3%, lower means less than, and um, the yield is the 3.8%. This statement, though, said that the yield, which is 3.8%, is lower, less than the bank rate, 3%. So then I looked at those two statements and I said, oh, well, 3 is less than 3.8, but 3.8 is not less than 3. So this one is not the situation I have. This one is the situation I have, which is why I circled that option. Now, part D says, how many shares of this company stock were traded yesterday? So for there, you're gonna look for volume 100. So I'm gonna take that amount and I'm gonna multiply it by 100. So it's like volume per 100. So it's this every 100. So that's why you have to multiply the two together and you get the total number of stocks that were traded. Now, what are the high and low prices of the share yesterday? Again, that's going to be these guys. So it's like once you get here, you start talking about what happened yesterday, okay? The stuff before it is what happens every year and the stuff after it happened today or yesterday, I'm sorry. Um, so then you've got that high and that low written here and here. Then it says, what is the price at which a share traded when the stock exchange closed. So keyword being closed, you look at the close amount and it's 57.66. G says, what was the change in price for a share of stock from the market closed two days ago to yesterday's market close? And that is called, it says change, it's called the net change. Okay. And the net change is given to you there. And since they already have the negative here, you're just going to type in the 1.48. Now, to compute the company's annual earnings per share, per share, that is over here for stocks. The annual earnings per share is the closing price per share over the P-E ratio. So we're taking the closing price per share and we're dividing it by the P-E ratio. So in this case, it's 57.66 dividing by 22. And this is what I got on the calculator, but it did say round to the nearest cent. And the zero was not enough for the two to go up, so I ended up with just 2.62. Suppose that you borrow $1,500 for 
for five years, so that's T, T equals five, at 5% 5 toward the purchase of a car. Find the monthly payments and the total interest for the loan. So since it's monthly payments, I know the N is 12. Now this one is also talking about purchasing a car. So when you're talking about purchasing cars or homes, um, you definitely need to use this formula, okay? So these are car and home payments. That's what the PMT is, okay? So it's car and home payments. So you use the same formula for both the cars and the home payments. Um, that means I'm using that formula and that formula said P, which is the amount the car costs, how much I'm gonna borrow. So uh, 15,000 and then R over N, so R over 12, one minus parentheses, one plus R over N, raised to the power negative N times T. I typed this whole thing in my calculator and it gave me this, but it said round to the nearest dollar. So zero was not enough for this to go up. So it stayed 283. So this is the monthly payment, okay? The second thing says, what's the total interest of the loan? So remember, this is your monthly payment. You pay it 12 times per year, and then you pay it for five years. So if I multiply all that together, that is my total deposits, which is the P. So then if you want interest, you have to do A minus P so you can calculate your interest. And so my interest is 1980. Um, in this case, that's not what we did. Um, we did P minus A to get the interest. What I paid minus, no, it's in different. Um, you're gonna take what you deposited minus what you borrowed. And that will give you the interest that you paid. There we go. Pick that labeling. Now, over here, it says, the price of a home is $165 or 65,000. The bank requires 20% down payment and three points at time of closing. The cost of the home is financed with the 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 10%. Um, a, find the required down payment. Well, since it's 20%, it's 20% of the home, cost of the home. So the cost of the home times 20% happens to be 33,000. So it says find the mortgage amount. Well, you only pay the mortgage on what you're gonna borrow. You're not gonna borrow the whole home value. You're gonna borrow the home value minus what you paid down. So I subtracted my down payment and this is the amount that I'm going to borrow. How much must be paid for the three points at closing? So three points means 3%. If it were five points, it would mean 5%. If it were one point, it would be 1%. So I did 3% times the amount that I'm going to borrow. It does have to be the amount that you're going to borrow, not the cost of the home here. Um, so we did that times the amount that we're going to borrow, and we get 3960. Now find the monthly payment. So I use this whole formula the amount that I'm gonna borrow, and then R was 10% for my loan. Um, it's compounded monthly, and then one minus one plus 10% over 12, um, and then negative in T. So N is 12 and 30. And it's always 12 because you're paying monthly payments, okay? So we typed all of this fraction in the calculator and it gave us this decimal. It did say round to the nearest dollar. So that was not enough to go up. So it just stayed 1158. Now to find the total cost of the interest over the 30 years, you're gonna take your monthly payment times 12 months per year times the 30 years. We get this as our total deposits. 
And then you want to get your deposit minus what you borrowed. And that gives you your interest that you paid. And so they paid that amount of interest. Now, for 24, we have um, consider the following pair of mortgage loan options. For a $195,000 mortgage, which mortgage loan has the largest total cost? And that's the closing cost plus the amount paid for points plus the total cost of interest. This is the one that's going to take the longest to find. So that's what I found first. This is just a matter of multiplying that percentage times the mortgage amount. And this one is just a matter of adding 1,600 for both, okay? So this one's the one that's a little bit longer to figure out. I'm doing it for both. So for the first scenario, I'm taking the amount of mortgage and calculating the payment using the payment formula. So that, and then I'm doing 7.25%, again, it's monthly, one minus parentheses, one plus 7.25% again over N to the negative N times T. And this is a 20 year. So I typed all of that in a calculator and it spit out this decimal. Um, and I think it asked me to round to the nearest dollar. So I rounded it to just, uh, or I think I did not round, I left it as a cents. So that rounded there to that much per month times 12 months per year times 20 years gave me this dollar amount to the nearest dollar, okay? Um, and then to figure out the total cost for option A, we're gonna do um, just the interest, okay? So we're gonna take the amount that we're paying minus the amount of the mortgage and that will give me the interest that I'm paying. So what's in this parentheses will give me the interest. Plus, so the interest is covered, plus the clo total closing costs, plus the amount paid for points. So remember the mortgage amount times the number of points percent. And so when I typed all of that in the calculator, three, six, nine, eight, nine, six, minus one, nine, five, zero, 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 plus 1600 plus um, 195000 times 1% close. And I got this value right here. Can I type that in there? 369896 minus 195. Let me pause real quick. Okay, and then, okay, so we got this as the total cost, okay? Then when we went in to do the other payment, we did 195, it's still the same mortgage value, times that percent over 12, one minus one plus that percent over 12 to the negative N times T, and T was also 20 years. So we typed in all of that in the calculator and we ended up with 1314. So 1314 times 12 months per year times 20 years comes out to this total deposits. So total deposits minus the mortgage gives you the interest plus the 1600 for the closing costs plus the five, the five points would be to multiply the mortgage cost times 5%. Type in this whole thing in the calculator and you end up with this value. So then 
the total cost of the first one minus the total cost of the second one gives us this as a difference. And if you look at the total cost, this is 178,000 versus 131,000. So mortgage A is the one with the larger total cost. And then what was the difference? It was this amount. So that is how you calculate um, number 24. Now, um, for number 25, we have this problem here that says um, the cost of a home is financed with $150,000 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 3.5%. Find the monthly payments and the total interest for the loan. So for the payments, it's going to be the, the value of the home that you're financing, 3% over N, 1 minus 1 plus 3.5% over 12 to so the negative 12 times 30 because it's a 30-year mortgage. That all comes out to this value amount. So the monthly payment is going to be 673.57. Um, and then to find the total interest, we're gonna be paying that per month for 30 years, which gives me this amount total that I paid. So you take what you paid minus what you borrowed, and that gives you the amount of interest. Then it says here, fill out the loan, like amortization, amortization, I don't know how to say that, schedule for the first three months of the mortgage loan. So for the first interest rate, okay, we're gonna take the value of the home because I have not made a single payment yet, right? The value of the home times 3.5% times the number of years, okay? Well, in one month, a whole year has not passed. Only one month out of 12 months has passed, right? Um, since the last time that I compounded it. So this multiplies out to give me that. So that's the amount of interest that I'm paying on my first payment. Then I'm going to take what I'm going to pay my monthly payment minus that interest is this value. So that's gonna be the amount of principal that I'm paying in my payment. And that's this value here. If that's the amount of principal, then that's the amount that goes toward my loan balance. So I would take 150,000 minus that principal, that amount of payment that goes towards principal. And I get that my loan balance is this amount. So then now for the second month, you're not using the original 15, uh, 150,000 anymore because that's not your loan balance, okay? You only have to pay your interest on what is still owed. So we're taking the previous loan balance times the rate times the time to give us the new interest amount, okay? So take your consistent monthly payment minus the new interest amount, and you get the new amount that's gonna to go toward your principal. So that's gonna get striked out against your loan balance. So take your loan balance, which is this value, minus that new principal value, and that gives me the new loan balance. Notice that it's going down a little bit, okay? Then to calculate the next month, you're going to take that previous loan balance times the rate times the time to get the new amount that's going to go towards interest. Once you know the amount that goes towards interest, you take your payment minus that interest. That'll give you the amount that's going to go towards principal. Once you know what's going towards principal, you take your loan, your previous loan balance minus that principal, and that'll give you the new loan balance. Now, number 26 says, advice from most financial advisor sales to spend no more than 28% of one's gross monthly income for one's mortgage payment, and to spend no more than 36% of one's gross monthly income for one's total monthly debt. Suppose a family has a gross annual income of $46,800. A, what is the maximum amount the family should spend each month on a mortgage? And what is the maximum amount the family should spend each month for total credit obligations? If the family's monthly mortgage payment is 60% of the maximum they can afford, what is the maximum amount they should expect they should spend each month for all other debt? So, um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take we're gonna find 20% um, of my gross monthly income. 
In order for me to find my gross monthly income, I basically have to take my annual income, because this is my annual income, and divide it by 12. So we're going to take 48, 46, 800, 0, and divide it by 12. That will give me my monthly income times 28% gives us this amount. So this is my maximum monthly mortgage amount. And the same thing over here. If I take my annual income and divide it by 12, that's my monthly income, and I'm going to multiply that by 36%. So that gives me this. So that's the maximum that should be for my credit. Now, it says that the monthly mortgage payment is 60% of the maximum they can afford. What is the maximum amount they should spend each month for all other debt? So you take this amount, this mortgage amount, the mortgage payment um, times 60%. And when I do that value times 60%, I end up with this amount. So you take your maximum total credit obligations minus this because it's supposed to be 60% and you get this value here. So this is the remaining amount of credit that you can spend on other things other than your mortgage. Then over here, it says 27, it says the credit card will be with the transactions described on the right uses the average daily balance method to calculate interest. The monthly interest rate is 1.5% of the average daily balance. Calculate parts A through D using the statement on the right. So for part A, it says find the average daily balance for the billing period. Now on the note sheet, average daily balance is down here. So I have to take the sum of unpaid balance for each day in the billing cycle divided by the number of days in the billing cycle. So in order for me to do that, I had to complete this chart. So what I did was I figured out that the unpaid balance at the beginning was this, okay? And then it stayed like that on March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. So for four days, it stayed like this. So if I add this number up for all four of those days, this is what I end up with. That's exactly the same thing as just multiplying these two together. So then, then I had a $300 credit. So I took my previous amount and I subtracted $300 since it's going to take my paid my unpaid balance down $300. So this is my new balance. Now my new balance was like that on the 5th and the 6th, so only for two days, which gives me this as a total. Then on the 7th, we had a charge at a restaurant, so that's going to make what I owe go up $30. So I took the previous balance and they added $30. And it stayed like that on the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and that's it. Because on the 12th, there has another change. So it was five days. So this times this gives me this total for those five days. Then on the 12th, we got another charge for 70 bucks for groceries. So we took the previous balance amount, added $70. Now we have the current unpaid balance. And that one stayed like that on the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So that was nine days. And then I multiply those and that gives me the total for the nine days. And then finally I had a last charge on the 21st. So that's um, 210. So the previous balance plus 210 is my new unpaid balance. And that one stays like that on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 30th, and then the end of the billing period, the 31st. So that one was like that for 11 days. So this times this gives me this total amount for the 11 days. So if I add up all my days, I get 31, which makes sense because there were 31 days in the billing period. And if I add up all of these, we end up with this total. So this is the sum for all the days, the unpaid balance sum for each day, and this is the number of days in the billing cycle. So we ended up with this value. It did say round to the nearest cent, so when I did it in the calculator, I went ahead and rounded already. Um, part B says find the interest to be paid on April 1st, the next billing date, round to the nearest cent. So remember what it said, it says 1.5% of the average daily balance. The average daily balance is this, so I'm going to do that value times 1.5%, which gives me 92.14 rounded to the nearest cent. So that was the amount of interest. 
then what would be the balance due? Well, it would be what I owe at the end of the period, right? My unpaid balance plus that interest. Okay, and then now part D says the credit card requires the monthly payment, um, a 10% minimum monthly payment. If the balance due at the end of the billing period is less than 360, this is the amount that's owed at the end of the billing period. That is not less than 360. So we are not doing the $10 minimum payment here. It says, otherwise the minimum monthly payment is one over 36 of the balance due at the end of the billing period. So I'm gonna take the amount that I'm gonna owe, right? Times one over 36. And that gave me this, but it said to round up. So I did round up. No matter what this decimal is, it does make it go up um, to 177. Now we're finally on to our last problem. So it's basically another one like the same, except here they have um, everything broken out for me. So on April 1st, this was my balance. Okay, so April 1st, this was my balance. And my balance stayed like that on the first, the second, and the third. So for three days. Then on the fourth, we had a change. We had a payment. So that means I was going to subtract $250 here. So I got this value. And then it stayed like that for the 4th, the 6th, the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, 10th, and the 11th, right? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There we go. So it stayed like that for eight days. Then we had another change. We had a charge of $60. So I'm going to add $60 to get this amount. Um, and then it stayed like that for the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th. So for five days. Then we got another charge for $100. So I'm going to add 100. And that gives me this amount. And it stayed like that for the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th. So for only four days. Then we had another charge for 270. So that gives us this balance. And that one stayed like that for the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th. So it stayed like that for 10 days. So if we add up all of the number of days, we should get 30 because the building period was 30 days. Um, and then if we find all these products and add them up all together, we get that daily sum. So the daily sum is this amount divided by the number of days we get this as our average daily balance. And so that's the value that goes there. Then if we wanna find the balance that's due, we take our average daily balance times 1.5%. That will give us just our interest. And so we're gonna to have to pay back our balance plus our interest, which gives us this amount. And so that is, the total balance due on May 1st. It didn't ask me what's the monthly payment, you know, the minimum monthly payment. All it asked me is what would be the final balance. And that is the end of this video. So when I see you in the next video, we'll be doing a whole nother um, unit in the next one.